Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the Now Israel and Morani Close series of Shirim. We're delighted that Dr. Hagit Blass is speaking tonight on the fascinating topic of the history, context, and meaning of the prayer for the state and the royal family. Hagit completed a PhD at Birkbeck University of London in Jewish law, focusing on halachic development. Her specific title was the Aguna in Jewish law, innovations and limitations. We have a dedication, Shira's dedicated to Nishmas Bela Bas Yosef, Stefana Levracha, whose yard site is the 27th of Tammuz, and David Zussel Ben Chaim Gedalia, Stefana Levracha, whose yard site is the third of Cheshvan, the parents of Abigail Hart. I hand over to you now, Hagit. Thank you. Uh, firstly, thank you to uh, Susan and Naomi and both shuls for. Uh, rescheduling me so I don't have to compete with football. Uh, I'm sorry, the outcome was as it was. It looked like we were winning for about four minutes and that was nice, but uh, I'll get on with the sheer now. So thanks for rearranging for me. Um, I will have my notes up on my screen. Um, uh, Susan, you're, you're more than welcome to screen share the source sheet if you wish, or if, if, if people want it up, I'll be orderly and say what source we're up to at all times. So you can share and unshare rather than uh, stick to the screen the whole time. And with that, I will start. Um, my topic today is the age old prayer, which Jews have been saying since they were exiled from Israel after the destruction of the first temple in 586 BCE. And according to some, perhaps even earlier, in which we pray for the welfare of the government of the country in which we live. The prayer is known as the Tfilah Lishlom HaMalchut, the prayer for the welfare of the sovereign, or more commonly known as Hanuten Chua, the two opening words of the most common prayer of this genre, which literally means mean he who gives salvation. The title of this shiul, which is the prayer for the queen and the royal family, is slightly inaccurate because the specific British prayer for the queen and the royal family is only one expression of the prayer for the welfare of the sovereign, which is said throughout the diaspora with each community referring to its government. I wish to focus less on the particular British version and more on the general genre of this prayer, its meaning, its origin, its history, and some contemporary matters related to it. From this brief introduction, it's already apparent that this prayer has various nusachim, various versions. Unlike most of our sidul, which is fixed and well-established, this prayer is fluid and dynamic. There are numerous versions of it, which were written and said throughout the generations in different places and at different times, and even within the same community in different congregations. It's one of the few prayers which we have the authority to keep changing in order to ensure it reflects our current situation within the society we live, and we do so. In fact, the British version, or one of the British versions, has been changed recently. In 2014, Chief Rabbi Mervis inserted an additional sentence into the prayer for the Queen and the Royal Family saying, may he bless and protect Her Majesty's armed forces and took the opportunity at the time to explain that the prayer itself expresses a central tenet of our identity, namely our appreciation of the importance of authority, secular law, and our duties as citizens. We'll get to this explanation shortly, but, the, but first I, I, I would like to point out that the, of the flexibility and the fluidity of this prayer. I couldn't think of other prayers within our classic Sidul that undergo, undergo frequent changes as this one does, not only in Britain, but in many other communities around the world. This characteristic is something we're used to and accept because it's part of the nature of this specific tefillah. Even more fascinating than our freedom to change and rewrite this tefillah is the fact that whichever version and whatever the wording, all of these prayers have one uniform meaning. So however much we change it, the central idea of this prayer has always remained identical. What are we praying for? We're praying for Shlom HaMalchut, the welfare of the government. What exactly that means, we'll discuss now. 
The classic version of the prayer, which has been recited for more than four centuries, is in source number one. It has been shortened by most UK communities during the second half of the 20th century, but features in the Rabbi Hertz Sidur from 1941, with a similar version in the modern Koren Sidur by Rabbi Sachs from 2009. In this version, we ask God to bless, guard, protect, help, exalt, magnify, and highly aggrandize the queen and the royal, the king and the royal family to grant them a long and prosperous rule and to inspire them with benevolence towards us and all of Israel, our brethren. We ask for blessings upon the land and for government officials to have the counsel necessary to make wise, compassionate decisions in line with the values of our tradition. And of course, there is a, year, a yearning for a return to Israel and for Geula Shlema. Since the destruction of the first temple, Jews recognize that our fate is tied to the welfare of the states in which we live and the quality of their governments. Hence, the central idea that we pray for is to live in a lawful, civilized society with a fair justice system and a well-developed system of government. Jewish political philosophy assumed that government, even an oppressive government, is superior to anarchy. Most point out that this prayer is a declaration in the spirit of Thomas Hobbes's theory regarding the social contract. Thomas Hobbes, the English 16th century political philosopher, who is considered to be one of the founders of mod modern political philosophy, claimed that individuals surrender some of their freedoms and submit to authority in exchange for protection of their rights and in order to maintain social order. In the absence of political order and law, everyone would have unlimited natural freedoms, including what he called the right to all things, and thus the freedom to behave violently, which will lead to an ongoing war of all against all. To avoid this, people contract with each other to establish a political community because life without government would be nasty, brutish, and short, as he put it. Hobbes, Hobbes saw government as an alternative to anarchy. This idea of the necessity of government is expressed by Chazal, who of course preceded Thomas Hobbes, who saw it as a necessary instrument for preserving life, law, and order. Therefore, we pray because we value leadership and understand its necessity. We also recognize that all governments are far from perfect and need siyata dishmaya, God's assistance, in order to function properly. In addition to this central point, which all versions of this prayer include, most incorporate, to one degree or another, a blessing for peace and prosperity. But first and foremost, it is a prayer to live in a lawful, civilized society with all of its ramifications. How have, has this prayer come about? What is the basis for this prayer? The Mishnah in Masechet Avot, which is in source number two, and Peri Gimel, Mishnah Bet, says, Rabbi Hanina Sgana Kohanim Omer, Hevei mitpalel bishloma shel malchut, she'ilulei mora'a, Ish et re'eu chayim bela'o. Rabbi Hanina, the vice high priest, says, pray for the welfare of, of the government, for were it not for the, for the fear it inspires, every man would swallow his neighbor alive. Rabbi Hanina, who was the deputy of the Kohen Gadol and never became the Kohen Gadol, states that we should pray for the government of our country because if we do not have a functional government, anarchy will prevail. Two questions arise from Rabbi Hanina's statement. First, what is his basis for adding another prayer into our corpus of prayers? And second, why is it that his views living in a lawful that, that he views living in a lawful society as such a fundamental matter as to require a dedicated prayer to express that? I'll begin with the second question and move on to the first. In order to do so, we'll look at who Rabbi Hanina, the vice high priest, was. Rabbi Hanina lived in the twilight years of the Second Temple, which was destroyed in the year 70 AD, during the post-Herod era. During that period, the Kihuna, the priesthood, suffered from corruption, and the nomination for the high priest was based on an oligarchic system rather than any spiritual or other criteria. 
the Kohen Gadol was expected to have strong links to the king and to be politically aligned with him, thus supporting his foreign policy, and of course, to be rich and generally well-connected. The position of Kohen Gadol was a political appointment rather than anything else, as described by Josephus. During Herod's reign, the Kohanim Gdolim came from the family of Baitos, which is mentioned in the Mishnah, and later, during the period we're discussing, its family, Katros, who dominated the priesthood, the Kehuna Gdola. Just to demonstrate how distant the appointments of Kohanim Gdolim was from our image of a Kohen Gadol, I'll explain how the Baitosim family Baitos became Kohanim Gdolim. Miriam, one of Herod's wives, was the daughter of Shimon from the Baitos family. As a wedding gift, Herod gave her father the role of Kohen Gadol. A few years later, both his brother and brother-in-law received the roles of Kohanim each for a few years. They all ruled as Kohanim until the year 6 AD. Two years earlier, in the year 4 AD, whilst Herod was ill, a few youngsters removed a golden eagle, which was placed over one of the gates of Beit HaMikdash as a symbol of Roman rule, for which they were executed. Herod held the Kohen Gadol responsible for this event, and as part of his ret retribution, Herod removed Matitya from being Kohen Gadol and appointed instead his wife's brother, Yoezer, to be Kohen Gadol. That's just a taste of how Kohanim Gdolim were appointed and replaced at the time. During this period, the Mishnah lists one worthy Kohen, and that is Chanina Sgana Kohanim, Chanina, the vice high priest from our Mishnah. The word Sgan means deputy. Why is, he know, why is he known as the deputy? Because he will never become the Kohen Gadol within this oligarchic system, where a small number of families of great wealth and political connections are the Kohanim Gdolim. He will forever remain a deputy and would never progress beyond because in the system which prevailed, Hanina had no chance of ever becoming a Kohen Gadol. And so he is known throughout the Mishnah as the vice or deputy of the Kohen Gadol, even though he was a genuinely worthy Kohen, which was worthy of being Kohen Gadol himself. His reality leads to his statement, pray to live under a lawful civilized regime because in the absence of such leadership, people will swallow each other alive. He who experiences the reality which leads to the destruction of the temple, fully understands the consequences of corruption and sinat chinam and the devastation that these forces breed. He therefore implores upon us to pray for a lawful, peaceful government as a means for a healthy and prosperous society. He links between justice, lawfulness, and peace. A lawful, civilized society brings peace. And that sequence is adopted in the halachic code of the tour, which is in source number three. In Ilchot Dayanim Siman Aleph, it says, Shimon ben Gamliel omer al shlosha dvarim haolam kayam, al hadin, veal haemet, veal hashalom. Kemo sheamru, hevei mitpalel beshloma shel malchut, sheil malei mora malchut, ishet reu chayim belao. The lords of judges begin. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel says, on three things the world exists, on judgment, on truth, and on peace. As they say in Avot, one should pray for peace of the government, for were it not for the fear of government, people would swallow each other alive. The tool opens the laws of judges in his halachic code with the teaching of Rabbi Hanina from our Mishnah by linking judgment, truth, and peace as a foundation for our existence. However, as strongly as Rabbi Hanina felt about the importance of living in a lawful society, his call to institute a prayer for the government to uphold these values requires a basis. And this basis is found in Tanakh, in Sefer Yirmiyahu, which is in source number four. In Yirmiyahu, Perik Kavtet Pasuk Zayin, it says, V'dirshu et shlom ha'ir asher regleti etchem shama, v'yitpalelu ba'ada el Hashem, Seek the welfare of the city to which I have exiled you and pray to the Lord on its behalf, in its behalf, for in, for in its prosperity, you shall prosper. The Malbim explains that abundance comes to the Jewish community through Babylon, and thus we must pray for the governments of the nations in which we live. This opinion is conveyed in the first translation you have on your sheet. 
whereas the second translation you have is the King's James Bible translation, which I believe is more accurate. I quoted both just because they demonstrate the influence of translation. But now back to our text. However, in order to better understand this pasuk within its wider context, I'll take a minute to discuss the prophet Yirmiyahu and this specific chapter within Sefer Yirmiyahu. I'll start with Yirmiyahu himself and continue with our specific chapter. Yirmiyahu is known as Nevi HaChurban, the prophet of the destruction of the temple. According to the Talmud in Masechet Bava Batra, Yirmiyahu wrote three books, Sefer Melachim, the Book of Kings, Kinot, Lamentations, and Sefer Yirmiyahu. He lived and prophesied during the last years of the Mikdash and witnessed its destruction. Sefer Yirmiyahu is the largest Sefer with Nevi, within Nevi'im Achronim with more than a thousand psukim. Chazal set out basic guiding principles through which we relate to prophets and their prophecies. The first principle is in source number five from Masechet Megillah. Nevua shehu tzrecha ledorot nichteva veshelo nitzrecha lo nichteva. Prophecies that were needed for future generations were recorded in the Bible and those that were not pertinent for later generations were not recorded in Tanakh. This first principles conveys the eternity of biblical prophecy. Every single prophecy which is incorporated in the Tanakh is there because it has an eternal message for all generations. The second principle we learn from Rashi in Masechet Chulin. Kol nevua v'nevua lefi tzorech hasha'a Every prophecy was said according to the needs of the time, the generation, and their actions. On the face of it, this principle, which states that every prophecy was written for its time, its generation, and their relevant actions, seems to contradict the first principle, which articulates the eternity of prophecies, but it does not. It clarifies that prophecies were always relevant to the people they were said to. However, the ones which were included in Tanakh are those which have eternal relevance to all generations. Prophecies combine the response to historical events of a specific generation together with a timeless relevance for all generations. And the third and final principle is in Masechet Sanhedrin. De'amar bi Yitzchak, signon echad ole lekama nevi'im, Rabbi Yitzchak says, a prophetic vision relating to one and the same subject matter may appear to several prophets, but two prophets do not prophesy employing one and the same style of expression. This pr principle relates to the individualism of each prophet. Although all prophets convey Dvar Hashem to the people, and the themes that all prophets discuss can contain similar messages about adherence to mitzvot and retaining our faith in Hashem. Every prophet has a unique style and method of expression. And even if the themes that different prophets discuss may be similar because we do have classic themes of nevuah, prophets are not replicas of one another, but rather have an individual tone which comes across from each and every navi. Just to summarize these principles, Nevu'ah encompasses individuality and commonality, both in relation to the, context, to the content and in relation to the delivery of each prophet and their eternal message. Now back to Yirmiyahu. Looking at Yirmiyahu through this prism, we identify his most important role as the call for tshuva as a means to prevent the destruction of the temple. He constantly calls upon Bnei Yisrael to do tshuva, and although he warns them of the grave consequences involved in disregarding his prophecies, they do not change their ways. Yirmiyahu therefore to continues to prophesy throughout the destruction of the temple and the Jewish exile to Bab Babylon, which he closely watches. He then begins a new type of nevuot nechama, prophecies of consolation and reconciliation, in which he envisions that the few Jews who remained in Eretz Yisrael and had not been exiled, of which he is one, 
will turn into the foundation of the return to Eretz Yisrael, where they will rebuild a new future. Now back to our chapter and to the Pasuk, which calls for praying for the government. Chronologically, this is where our chapter is situated. After the destruction of the temple and the exile to Babylon, when rebuilding and looking onto the future slowly becomes the new reality. The chapter begins with Yirmiyahu sending a letter from Jerusalem to Ziknei Agola, the elders which have been exiled and didn't die on the way, but actually made it to Babylon, and to the Kohanim, Nevi'im, and the rest of Am Yisrael. Source number six. Here are the few psukim before the one calling for praying. Pasuk Dalit. Ko amar Hashem tzvaot elokei Yisrael, lechol agola asher igleti miyerushalayim bavela. This pasuk stresses two things. Firstly, that Hashem isn't limited to Eretz Yisrael, but is boundless. He's therefore speaking to the exiled Jews. And the second is that Hashem is behind the exiling of Bnei Yisrael. Their fate has been orchestrated by Hashem. And the advice is in Pasuk Hei, Bnu batim ushvu v'nit'u ganot v'ichlu et pirian. Hear the message of build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit is that if you build houses and plant gardens, you will have the opportunity to enjoy them. You will eat the fruit they bear because you are not returning to the land of Israel just yet. It will take a few generations until returning to Eretz Yisrael becomes a possibility, more accurately, 70 years. And therefore, rebuild your society and settle in Babylon, invest in your future in Babylon. As it says in Pasuk Vav, these psukim are fascinating because they inform the Jewish psyche forever. Jews always look to the future, and these psukim are the origin of our hardwired outlook. And through these psukim, we see that it is God's will that we do so. And lastly, to our specific pasuk, besides advancing personally, make a positive effort for the city in which you dwell and pray for its well-being because your welfare is intertwined with the, gener with the general welfare of what is now your hometown. V'dirshu et shlom ha'ir asher igleti etchem shama v'yitpalelu ba'ada el Hashem ki b'shloma iye lachem shalom. This message, which Yirmiyahu sends in Hashem's name, is the basis for the Mishnah in Avot, which is the basis for our weekly tefillah for the welfare of the state. From this attitude, we learn of the, from this background, sorry, we learn of the attitude of Judaism towards the lands we inhabit, and that this prayer is not only ancient, but rooted in a biblical source said by a prophet who explicitly states that this is the word of God. Having discussed the meaning and context of the prayer, I'd like to ask, when did we actually incorporate this tefillah into our davening routine? How long have we been saying this prayer for? The oldest known version of this prayer was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. That version is a prayer for the Hasmonean king, Yonatan, who was the nephew of Judah Maccabee. It was said by the community of Qumran and dates back to 130 BCE. And we have the manuscript of the prayer. The text was found on one of the columns of the manuscript, which was said by the Qumran community in Eretz Yisrael, and they prayed for the welfare of the king who was a representative of the Seleucid empire and for all Jews all over the world, similarly, similarly to our prayer today. But even before Qumran, we have reference to the existence of such a prayer in the Tosefta, which says the custom to pray for the king has been done since the days of the first temple. This is based on a pasuk in Sefer Melachim, the book of Kings, which describes the completion of the first temple in the days of King Solomon. There's a beautiful prayer that Solomon prays upon the com completion of the temple. And after that, the Pasuk says, On the eighth day, 
he sent the people off and they blessed the king. By the way, this source and all other sources, which I'll refer to now, are not on your sheet. I'll let you know when I'm back onto source number seven on the sheet. The Tosefta in Sukkah, Perek Dalid, cites this pasuk, which says on the eighth day, he sent the people off and they blessed the king. And the Tosefta refers to this specific bracha. And Rashi in Masechet Yoma understands the Tosefta as referring to a special independent prayer for the, for the king. That's the bracha. So according to Rashi, a prayer for the king has been said since the days of the first temple. But in terms of manuscripts that list the exact wording of this prayer, after the Qumran manuscript, we have a historical gap with manuscripts of Sidurim and other compilations about prayer, not mentioning the exact text of the prayer for the local government. However, in the 19th century, a commentary on the Sidur called Seder of Amram HaShalem reveals that already during the decrees of 1096, such a prayer was incorporated into Pinkas Vermeiza with the following version. He who blesses Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov should bless our master, his excellency, the king, and send blessings of success to him to reign lawfully and mercifully in the land for life and peace. And he and his descendants shall enjoy peace. Amen. Although this Nusach is different, it conveys the same message as we do today. After that, we found the following halacha in Sefer Kolbo, which was first printed in 1490 in Naples. In Ilchot Kriyat HaTorah, it says, on Shabbat, after the Haftarah, it is customary to bless the king and the con congregation. Interestingly, we find the exact same development in the Sephardi tradition. The Abu Draham, who was a commentator on the Tefillah and wrote a book in 1340, writes that not only on Shabbat, but also on Mondays and Thursdays after laning, the congregation blessed the kings. After laning, the Shliach Tzibur says Kaddish, and there is a custom to bless the king and pray that God assists him, it says. So it is a well-established ancient prayer. But what is its legal status? Is it a minhag, a halacha, a mitzvah? What legal status does this prayer have? Within our sidul, our different prayers have different halachic statuses. For example, staying shma is midoraita while other prayers can be midrabanan or merely minhagim. What kind of prayer is this prayer? It's definitely not midrabanan because it is not rooted in the Torah. We also know that not all communities are particular about reciting it. So what exactly is its status? Both the Shulchan Aruch and the Rambam do not mention this prayer in Hilchot Filah, the halachot of davening, and therefore most claim that this prayer is a minhag. They base themselves on the fact that it is written in Pirkei Avot, which is a tractate dedicated to conduct, social interaction, and ethics rather than to halacha. For it to have halachic gravitas, it should have been written in Masechet Brachot, which discusses, amongst others, our davening practices. Its placement in a non-halachic tractate indicates that it is not obligatory, but rather customary. In addition to, they refer to the language of the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, which opens with the words, Hevei mitpalel, and you shall pray for the welfare of the government. Not you must or just pray, but you shall pray. This softer language is indicative of it being a custom rather than an obligation. This is one school of thought. The opposing school of thought views praying for the state as an obligation. As the Me'iri in Masechet Avodah Zarah writes, Chayav Adam Li'itpalel Bishlomah Shel Malchut, She'il Malei Mora'a, Ishet Re'ehu Chayim Blao. One is obligated to pray for the welfare of the sovereign. And based on the Me'iri, others, such as Shut Mikhtav Sofer, write, Our rabbis obligated us to pray for the welfare of the regime. But, most in, but the most interesting view of this prayer, which I'd like to introduce, suggests neither of these approaches, viewing it as neither a minhag nor an obligation. I will now introduce a new category of mitzvot, which relate 
not only to our tefillah, but to other practices and prayers. In order the, to do this, I will deviate from our topic and discuss the recitation of Hallel. But don't worry, I will tie it all in and get back to our tefillah and clarify its legal status. Now I'm going back to our prayer for one minute. Rabbi Moshe ibn Machir, one of the Gdolim of Tzfat and a disciple of the Ari and Rabbi Yosef Kao, writes in his book, Seder Ayom, of the importance of this prayer and classifies it as a mitzvat aseh midivrei kabbalah, which is the category I wish, I wish to discuss. A mitzvat aseh midivrei kabbalah is a positive mitzvah with biblical origin, which is not in the Torah. The biblical origin is, of course, Sefer Yirmiyahu. The term midivrei kabbalah conveys that the mitzvah was received from the root lekabel via prophecy or ruach hakodesh rather than from the Almighty himself in the Torah. This term or classification of a mitzvah with biblical roots, which are not in the Torah, was a careful and well thought out categorization because this term of a mitzvah asemi divrei kabbalah refers to the way the Ravid in his Hasagot on the Rambam, his critique on the Rambam, classifies the obligation to say Hallel on festivals. In order to understand this interesting category and the link between saying Hallel and our prayer, I wish to digress for a minute and discuss the recitation of Hallel on Chagim, which is in itself fascinating. We all know that we have mitzvot midoraita, mitzvot which originate in the Torah, mitzvot midrabanan, mitzvot that Chazal instituted, and we have a third category, mitzvot midivrei kabbalah. These are mitzvot which do not have a basis in the Torah itself, in the five books of the Chumash, but have a source within another book of the Tanakh in Nevi'im or Ketuvim, the book the books of the prophets or the writings. So it's not a mitzvah midoraita. It's not a mitzvah midirabanan, it's a mitzvah midivrei kabbalah, a biblical mitzvah which isn't from the Torah. Now to Hallel. An Chagim, we recite Hallel. I'm not referring to Rosh Chodesh when we say an abridged version, only to Chagim. What is the origin for the obligation to say Hallel? Is it a mitzvah from the Torah or is it midirabanan? The Gemara discusses this question in several places and doesn't reach a clear-cut conclusion on the matter. Different sugyot in the Gemara reach different conclusions. For example, this is uh, the Gemara in Masechet Erchin on Daf Yud, asks what the origin of Hallel is. And this is on your sheet. I'm back to source number seven. And the Gemara answers with a quote from Sefer Yishayahu. Hashir yiyeh lachem keleil hitkadesh chag. The song will be yours like the night of the festival's consecration. Meaning that when we have an evening that brings about a chag, a festival, it carries with it the obligations of reciting a song, the song of Hallel. And when we do not have the sanctification of the chag, we are not obligated in reciting a song. In the words of the Gemara, Laila ha mekudash lachag taun shira, vesheino mekudash lachag ein taun shira. A night sanctified to a chag requires a song, the song of Hallel, and a night which isn't sanctified to a chag does not require a song. This Gemara identifies the origin and obligation of saying Hallel with a pasuk from Tanakh, which is not in the Torah. So it's neither a mitzvah from the Torah nor midrabanan, but one that is rooted in a biblical pasuk. However, the Gemara in Ta'anit has a different view. It reaches the conclusion that saying Hallel is from the Torah, is midrabanan. This Gemara discusses, it's not on your sheet, the twice daily sacrifice, which was brought every morning and every afternoon in the Mikdash on behalf of the entire nation. The entire Jewish people sacrifice two korbanot every day known as korban atamid. Since we are not permitted to sacrifice a korban without the presence of the owners of the korban, there was a daily representation of Am Yisrael 
during the sacrifice of these korbanot, which was organized via a system of shifts. Every day, a shift of representative would be present during the sacrifice of these korbanot. The shifts were called ma'amadot. However, the shifts were canceled on festivals when Hallel was reciting, including on Hanukkah. The Gemara asks, can the shifts be canceled also on Rosh Chodesh because of the recitation in Hallel, of Hallel? And the answer is no, the shift cannot be canceled for saying Hallel on Rosh Chodesh because that Hallel is not from the Torah. It is not Mideoraita. From this, we deduce that Hallel on festivals is Mideoraita. So the conclusion of the second Gemara is that Hallel is from the Torah. Now to the third Gemara. The Gemara in Masechet Brachot, Daf Yudalid, claims that saying Hallel is Midrabanan. It discusses interrupting one's tefillah in order to greet another person and asks whether Hallel can be interrupted for such a greeting. The Gemara replies saying that surely if one can stop during Shema, which is Midrabanan, to say hello to another, Kal v'chomer, that they can interrupt Hallel, which is Midrabanan, to say hello to another person. So here the Gemara clearly says that Hallel is Midrabanan. All in all, we have three different opinions within the Talmud. One that views Hallel as being rooted in a biblical pasuk, which isn't in the Torah. One that views the recitation of Hallel as a Torah obligation. And one that views saying Hallel as being Midrabanan. So which is it? The Rishonim try and understand these different positions. And of course, we have various opinions amongst them. The Ramban claims that Hallel is Midoraita. The Rambam says it's Midrabanan. But most interesting from today's perspective is the Ravid, who wrote a critique on the Rambam known as Hasagot because it's devoted mainly to his disagreements with the Rambam. The Ravid says that saying Hallel is neither Midoraita nor Midrabanan, but a mitzvah midivrei Kabbalah, just like the Sefer Hayom says about the prayer for the government, because Hallel has a basis in a pasuk in Tanakh, but not in the Torah. Therefore, it should be treated as a mitzvah midivrei Kabbalah, just like our prayer has a basis in Sefer Yirmiyahu. Hallel is not alone. There are other mitzvot which it, within this specific category, which are neither Midoraita nor Midrabanan, but from a biblical source outside the Torah. Such is the mitzvah of Kvod Shabbat, respecting Shabbat, and Onig Shabbat, enjoying the Shabbat. These two mitzvot of honoring Shabbat via our preparations prior to it, and enjoying the Shabbat on Shabbat itself with special meals, etc., are also mitzvot midivrei Kabbalah because they are, ba they are based on a pasuk in Sefer Yishayahu, which is in source number eight, back on the sheet, which says, V'karata la Shabbat oneg, likdosh Hashem mechubad. Proclaim the Shabbat a delight and the holy day of Hashem honored. By the way, this pasuk is incorporated by many into their Shabbat morning kiddush. Same is true for reading Megillat Esther, which is an obligation mentioned in the Megillah itself, which is, of course, a biblical source outside of the Torah, as well as the four minor fasts, which are mentioned in the book of Zechariah. And there are practical ramifications for this category of mitzvot, mitzvot midivrei Kabbalah. For example, we usually paskin, safek deoraita lechumra, vesafek de rabanan, Likula, where we have an unsure situation, a safek. If it relates to a mitzvah midoraita, we are more stringent. And if it relates to a mitzvah midrabanan, we are more lenient. And many think that a mitzvah midivrei kabbalah should be treated like a mitzvah midoraita in case of a safek. So in this specific respect, it is closer to a mitzvah midoraita. According to the Seder Hayom, our tefillah fits this category perfectly. It's not a mitzvah midoraita, but it carries more weight than merely a minhag. It, it originates in the Tanakh and is an ancient, well-established practice of importance. It is in the same category as Hallel, 
minor fasts, and kavod and onig Shabbat, and therefore should not be taken lightly. Now that I've discussed the halachic aspect of this prayer, I'd like to go back to the prayer itself and its various manifestations. Since this prayer does not have a fixed text, it's fascinating to follow the changes it underwent throughout the centuries in various location, because those changes reveal the political, social, and religious shifts that communities underwent over time. To a large extent, this prayer is an expression of how Jews as a minority group view themselves, their political realities, their insecurities, and their fears. I would like to discuss some of these sociological aspects. During the Middle Ages, as observed by the historian Chai, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, the Jews in medieval Christian Europe inevitably yet willingly allow, allow, allied themselves to the crown as the best and ultimately the only guarantor of stability and security. From the Middle Ages onwards, Jews in many of these countries also held the status of servi camerea, servants of the royal chamber. This meant that the ruler had the right to tax Jews for the benefit of his tre treasury, but at the same time protected them when they were in danger from others. In fact, the laws of Edward the Confessor enacted in England in the 12th century defined the status of Jews as follows. All Jews, wherever in the realm they are, must be under the king's liege, protection, and guardianship, nor can any of them put himself under the protection of any powerful person without the king's license, because the Jews themselves and all their chattels are the king's. If therefore anyone detained them or their money, the king may claim them if he so desire, and if he is able as his own. This of course was not unique to England, but prevalent all over Europe. As a result, there was in Yerushalmi's words, a royal alliance born of necessity and confirmed by history. Jews who casted their lot with the sovereign also prayed for its welfare. The well-known Nusach, which became widespread all over the world, which begins with Hanuten Shua, or as traditionally translated, he who gives salvation unto kings and dominion unto princes, is believed to have been written in the 16th century by Jews expelled from Spain and Portugal who traveled along the Sephardic trade routes and was adopted with slight changes by Ashkenazi Jews throughout Central and Eastern Europe. In 1655, the Dutch scholar and rabbi Menashe ben Israel published the English translation of this prayer as part of his efforts to secure the readmission of Jews into England. He described the prayer as the continual and the never broken custom of Jews wherever, wheresoever they are on the Sabbath day or other solemn feast to have the minister of the synagogue bless the prince of the country under whom they live that all the Jews may hear it and say, Amen. The intention was to bless Oliver Cromwell who allowed Jews back into England on the condition that they pledged to bless their rulers. After Cromwell, they bless Charles II. Though these are experiences of European Jews, I believe the Sephardi Jews had similar experiences in the countries they lived in. I could not find dedicated research on this specific matter in Sephardi con congregation, and if anyone knows, I'd be happy to hear. Although the prayer speaks of Jewish loyalty, some say that it contains a subversive subtext which the well-known educated elite would understand and which, trans and which testifies to the res resistance and self-respect of Jews at the face of religious persecution. The prayer begins with a quote from Tehillim 144.10, he who gives salvation unto kings and he who rescues his servant David from the hurtful sword. But the subsequent verse in that Perik in Tehillim says, rescue me and deliver me out of the hands of strangers whose mouth speaks falsehood and their right hand is a hand of lying. And there's a theory that the psukim we say out loud allude to the less favorable 
continuation of the chapter. Similarly, similarly it says, Hanuten bayam derech, he who made a road through the sea, which is a quote from Isaiah. But Tupsukim, prior to that, there is a description of the downfall of Babylon, which may represent Galut in general. In addition, there's a quote from Isaiah, he who shall come as a redeemer of Zion. But Tupsukim, before that, there's a call for vengeance. And of course, the closing of the prayer, which asks for the return from the exile and the restoration of the Davidic dynasty. According to this theory, Jews prayed aloud for the welfare of the sovereign upon whom their security depended, but read between the line the call for rescue and redemption. This may explain why Jews prayed for the sovereign even under adverse conditions. Jews blessed the Tsar, as we know from the rabbi and fiddler on the roof. When Leibish asks him whether there's a proper prayer from the Tsar, he replies, of course, may God bless and keep the Tsar far away from us. Most interesting is what German Jews did under the Third Reich. There, it took different communities a different amount of time to stop reciting the prayer for the government. Whilst some communities stopped saying Hanuten Shua already in 1933, it took others until after Kristallnacht to do so. As far as we know, no community recited Hanuten Shua after November of 1938. All this may ring true for European Jewry throughout the generation. However, the experience of American Jewry is vastly different. Although American Jews recited this prayer before the nation declared independence, its experience as a community is much different from that of Jews in other parts of the world, mainly because American Jews were always regarded in the eyes of the law as citizens like any other. Their equal treatment was a constitutional mandate and American Jews from the inception of the nation looked upon themselves as full participant in the enterprise of democratic government. This of course was a new experience for a people who until the French Revolution had been denied such status elsewhere. For this reason, the classic text, which implores the ruler to have mercy upon the house of Israel and treat them kindly, seemed inappropriate for American Jews who set out to amend the text to reflect their own political existence. Congregation Sheherit Israel in New York, also known as the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue, is the oldest congregation in the United States, dating back to the early colonial period. The congregation was made up of Sephardic Jews who were the first to reach the United States and came through Brazil and the West Indies. They prayed in their native Portuguese for King George and his family when New York stood under English rule. However, however within a week of American independence, they changed the, play, the prayer to, pray, to bless George Washington and switched to English. As a side note, this pride, proud and patriotic congregation says Hallel and Thanksgiving until this very day. Surprisingly, the prayer did not undergo significant changes in the transition from an English monarch to a post-revolution American system of government, besides omitting the names of office holders, all but George Washington's name at the time. This custom of mentioning office holders without naming them, i.e. the president and the vice president, is the custom until this very day. The American version underwent many changes over the years, but two are worth mentioning. The first is the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. This momentous event forced Jews around the world to consider the relationship between prayers for the new Jewish homeland and prayers for the land they viewed as their home. One of the first to deal with this was Birnbaum, the Orthodox liturgist. In his Sidur, published soon after the establishment of Medinat Israel, he edited his Sidur with the prayer for the state of Israel by the chief rabbinate of Israel to follow the traditional prayer for the government. This pattern of saying Hanuten Shua, the prayer for our country first and for Medinat Israel second became standard and may or may not be an indication of priorities. The other interesting development is the art scroll Sidur from 1984, which includes no prayer, for any government whatsoever, but has a note saying that in many congregation, a prayer for the welfare of the state is recited. 
These changes shed light on the growing confidence of the American Jewish community on their faith, politics, and acculturation. Before I end, I would like to say a few words about Tfilah Lishloma Medina, the prayer for the state of Israel, which is from the same genre. Although the origin of the prayer for the welfare of the government is for the exiled Jews, the chief rabbis at the time of the establishment of the state of Israel felt that there should be an Israeli version for this tefillah, which reflects the existence of Jewish sovereignty in Israel. This in itself is fascinating. The fact that a prayer, which was established and said for the protection and safety of Jews in exile from anarchy and oppression should be transcribed to a reality of an independent Jewish state under Jewish rule is noteworthy. It demonstrates the foresight and vision that the chief rabbis of the time had in 1948. They not only understood the fundamental importance of living in a lawful civilized society, but also realized that even in our lands governed by our people who are our representative, having a well-run government with a fair justice system cannot be taken for granted and is worth praying for. Therefore, the Ashkenazi chief rabbi of the time, Rav Herzog, whose grandson was just appointed as the president of the state of Israel, together with Rav Uziel, the Sephardi chief rabbi at the time, wrote and published this tefillah. All agree that the Israeli author and Nobel Prize laureate, Shai Agnon, was involved in writing the text of the prayer to one degree or another. And it was recently established by Yoel Rappel that Shai Agnon didn't write the entire prayer as some had thought, but assisted the chief rabbis in writing it. This prayer reinforces the basic idea of all the versions of this prayer, to live in a lawful society and to pray for Jews all around the world together with other unique themes that are relevant to Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel, such as Israel's fragility in the Middle East and its ongoing military struggles. In it, the state of Israel is described as Rishit Tzmichat Geulatenu, the initial sprouting of our redemption. This phrase caused unease amongst various communities, which Lord Jacobowitz articulated when he called for reservation of judgment on whether the present state of Israel is in fact the embryonic nucleus out of which the ultimate redemption is bound to develop with all its universal ramifications of the messianic era. Needless to say that whether we do or don't refer to Medinat Israel as the beginning of the messianic era, we incorporate it in our tefillah and hope that all it articulates continues to materialize. I'd like to end by going beyond this specific prayer. As we saw from Yirmiyahu the prophet through Hanina the vice high priest in Pirkei Avot and throughout the generations and various versions of Hanuten Chua, including the prayer for Medinat Israel, the uniform elements and guiding principle in all the prayers for the government is a call to live in a law-abiding society which will bring about justice and peace. Having a secular legal system which governs our everyday lives is fundamental because without such a system, anarchy will prevail. And just as this prayer and its various versions reveal much about the relationship between the community and the state, so does omitting this prayer. Commit communities who omit this prayer do so as an ideological expression of their values, not coincidentally. They do so as a refute of the very principle of adherence to the law, which has practical manifestations such as we have seen during the recent pandemic. And so the decision whether or not to say Hanuten Shua on Shabbat morning goes beyond the davening itself. It's more substantial than the two minutes it takes to recite the prayer. It's about the choices communities make and whether or not they pray to live in a society that values lawfulness or prefer to skip this part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Haget. Uh, does anyone have any questions? You can unmute yourself 
I'll put the question in the chat. Well, while we're waiting for questions, I'll take the opportunity to thank you so much. Such an excellent, fascinating, detailed, thought-provoking analysis and insights into the prayer for the state and the royal family and tackling this topic in such a profound and meaningful way. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone when I say we all learned so much. Thank you. Thank you. This Susan. is our last year in the series and Esther are delighted to organize the series jointly with Riley Close Shaw. I'd like to thank the committee, our committee members. So from Riley Close, I'd like to thank Naomi Landy, Robertson Ginsbury and Sandy Lippman. And from Neostra, Robertson Zobin, Michelle Sint, Debbie Meyer, Julie Conn, and Daniela Reich. I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us for the Shirim and made the series a, such a success over Zoom. We look forward to being physically in shawl again for our monthly winter series and then our weekly series next summer. Um, please God. We've missed seeing everyone in person and hope you have a wonderful summer. And Hagit, you can see all the thanks on Zoom, which is wonderful. Thank you all. Yes, Th thank you very much, Hagit. That was amazing. And thank you, Susan, for all your efforts uh, for the whole series. Uh, it wouldn't happen without you, and you do brilliantly. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Nami. Thank you. you. Well done, everyone. Okay, I will wish everyone a good night and thank you again, Hagit, and the thanks keep pouring in. <laughs> thank you all. All right, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.